Okay, everybody say hi to Amelia. Hi, Amelia. Hi. Hi. Okay. We are now officially recording, we hope. Let's see if this all works. Cool. All right, so, good morning. Good it's morning. still morning, isn't it? Good morning. And you got five more minutes. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, we ask that you help us read, mark, and inwardly digest your word in the form of the New Testament. We ask that you help us learn faithfully, not only the words, but also the heart of what you said and how you lived. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. I'm going to join for a few minutes if I may. You may. You may. Is this spot open? Thank you. You are most welcome. Um, I have a, a warning for next Sunday. There is a possibility that I may not be in town next Sunday. Um, I have a, a family member who is near death, and uh, I may have to go out to Indiana for a funeral. So, we gotta be flexible, guys, okay, in terms of what we're doing. So I'm gonna leave the group next week. What'd you say? <laughs> so I said, so I'm gonna leave the group next week. Oh, good. Well, that takes care of that, then we're covered. Good. Um, I could teach it for you if you want. Oh, did you hear that? Did you hear that? <laughs> I, I was, would do it. Good. I was actually going to ask you about another Sunday also. Okay. <laughs> cool. That would be awesome. Which Sunday? Huh? Which other Sunday? 23rd? I think it's okay. Well, I'll have to check. For the 23rd, the options are somebody else teaches it or we do it later in the afternoon because I have to be in Schenectady until about 2 o'clock. So that we'll deal with that one as we get along. Okay. I am trying to cram in basically two to three classes into this one class because we have a very short window to work on. So uh, last time when the bishop came last time, we had the scripture spread out over five classes. Now we have them condensed into two because we just don't have the window. We, we, we have such a small window. Um, so... I, and I hate this, but uh, I was still expecting the bishop to come in the fall, not in March. So that's why we're on such a tight schedule. Um, so there we have it. However, we can address a few basics, just as we all we could really do was address a few basics last week in terms of addressing the Old Testament. I, w I will say it was nice that we had some conversations via email afterwards. And that's why I sent you all these, the, these things ahead of time. I don't know if you actually got them. I mean, if you have your own private email address, you got it. I don't know if your parents passed them on to you or not. Um, I, 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 yes, at least one did. Good. So, <clears throat> but we're going to go talk about two things. The, the New Testament, you remember how last week we were talking about the Old Testament being divided up into three parts, basically. Rough, rough, basic parts. Remember what they were? The law. The law? The prophets. The prophets? And the writings. And the writings! Awesome! All right. Yeah. Good job, guys. Uh, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And we talked about, very briefly, how they were all written over different periods, over lots, of, uh, lots and lots of years, often hundreds of years after the events happened. Remember that? All right. Then we talked about which books were in there. With me so far. The New Testament is a lot more condensed in a lot of ways. It happened, everything that it, that is in the New Testament happened in a much shorter period of time, roughly about a hundred years, we'll call it, give or take. Right? So it's a, it's a much tighter frame. It's basically a, a generation of people, or a generation and a half. Most of, the, most of the stories all happened with the same people or those that came right after them. So it's a very, very tight time frame, right? Whereas the Old Testament was spread out over hundreds of years, right? What are the two most basic divisions of the New Testament. And there are other little subdivisions, but the two most basic divisions. Any thoughts on that one? You mean in like what kind of books are in? In what kind of books, yeah. 
And we read from both of them every Sunday. You may not even notice that. We think about on Sunday, what do we do first? I don't have any with me. Wait, we just the yeah, well, okay, wait, wait, what'd you say? We have the gospel. The gospel, which that's the one that we all process down and you're all standing up, right? Right? There's the gospel. And before that, we actually read. Epistle. Say that again? Epistle. The epistle. That's it. Good job. There are other aspects, too, that we'll get into. They got them. They got them. They got them? Yeah, here they go. So, yeah, the gospel. And the epistle. The epistle we read first, although oddly enough, it appears later in the, in the Bible, right? But we have those two aspects. What is a gospel? Can I get a good thought? Maybe like a teaching? A teaching? Not bad. What do you think? Look at today's gospel. See who's the main character. <laughs> Let's see. Bill was there for the gospel, I think. And Jalen was there for the gospel. Who are we talking about in the gospel? In today's, you know, if you think back every single Sunday when we read the gospel, who's the main character? Jesus. Say it again, Grace. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. The gospel in, in our Bible, when we talk about the gospel, and we'll talk about what the word gospel means, but in the Bible, whenever we talk about um, the gospel, it's always the story of Jesus, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's where we start. The word gospel comes from uh, an older form, which means good news. And we're gonna, we can talk about, you know, the, the Greek. If you've ever heard of anybody called an evangelical, you ever hear that? That's from the Greek, basically meaning good news. And it gets morphed through language into gospel. I mean, because there's a lot of different language shifts, a lot of different, you know, the, the, the news travels throughout different countries and different languages, and we end up with gospel. But it's basically good news. That's what it means. Back when I was in high school, they came out with a, a version of the, um, of the Bible, and they called it Good News for Modern Man. You remember I the remember Good that News Bible? One. Oh, Lordy, yes. Oh, yeah. I, I had. I had my youth group Good News Bible right there, and there may, you know what? I think my mom might have one. I'll bet she does. I'll bet she does. Oh yeah, look, right there. Good News Bible. But good, it means good news. The gospel, that's what it means. So we know that one division of the New Testament is the gospels. Now you got the other division, which is, you know what, let's write that word down so we can... <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I got another one in the other room though. That's okay. So you got the gospel or gospels. How many biographies of Jesus, aren't they? Yeah. How many of them are there? Do you know? Four, exactly. Extra credit, can you name who wrote them? Or who they're attributed to? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Good. Okay, so we got four Gospels. And they are basically the story of Jesus. Jesus is the main character. They tell kind of the story a little differently in each one, but we'll get to that in a minute. Then we have, what, what was that word again? Jenna? The, oh, the epistles. Epistles. All of these church words. But epistle is just a really simple thing. Do you know what it really is? 
I mean, why didn't somebody open up one of the... Where did that bug... Oh, here it is. Let's just pull one out. And let's look and see how it begins. So, Jalen, why don't you read just like the first couple of verses on that one? Read it really loud because I'm <clears throat> going deaf. And Amelia's got to hear. All right. Is Amelia here? No, she. we're recording it oh, for hi, her. Amelia. I always give thanks to my God for you. Start right there. Oh, okay, okay. From Paul, who was called by the will of God to be an apostle mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus, and from our brothers, Sosthenes, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to all who are called to be God's holy people, who belong to him in union with Christ Jesus, together with all people everywhere who worship our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Great, thank you. What, how did it begin? From Paul and everybody else to Jesus Christ. Well, to uh, God, the Lord God. To the people, oh. to, to the church in Corinth, right? So, it's from Paul to these folks. It's a letter. So, and that's really all the word epistle means is it's a letter. So we have these biographies, kind of. Biographies with a purpose. And we have these letters with a purpose. And we have a lot of letters. That's something completely different from what you've seen in the, in the Old Testament. You know, where you've got history stuff and you've got... Um, family story and then you've got all these prophets and then you've got all these other uh, other writings um, including poems you know from the Psalms and stuff like that but now we have biographies of one specific person and letters and most of these letters what are they about take a stab at this one <laughs> really the answer is almost right if you say Jesus Jesus. <laughs> it, it, it. When it you're talking starts. New Testament, <laughs> if anybody says, well, what's it about? You can almost always say, Jesus. I, I go to the nursery school and I read little Bible stories to them all the day. I, 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 every day, every, every week I go in and I read Bible stories to the kids. And, and they're like, what is this story about? Jesus! <laughs> well, so actually, this is Noah's Ark, but still. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, they, they're totally into the whole idea of, of anything New Testament. It's Jesus. It's Jesus and how Jesus relates with us. But they, so we have two basic divisions. I say basic because there are a couple of things that don't quite fit. And we don't really need to get into them today too much. Um, but if you've ever heard of the book of Revelation, ever hear of that one? It's, it's very odd, very long, and hard to do. We did this in the, uh, over with the Bible study, and we took a year to do it. And at the end of it... One of the folks said, I still don't get it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hard one. Um, and we don't need to focus on that one right now, because well, let's just do the basics for the... Um, let's go back to the Gospels for a second. We said that there's a story of Jesus, right? And Grace, you said how many... Which ones were there? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, so let's... let's Put that there in parentheses for now. We'll go to Matthew. Who? Mark. Mark. Luke. Luke. And? John. John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why, why do we have four? What, just give me some speculation on why you think there might be four Gospels. I mean, how many Jesuses are there? Just the one. Just the one, that's right. So why do we need four? That seems odd. 
Say that loudly. Different point of view. Did you hear that, Amelia? She's not answering back now. Different point of view, you're right. Each one of these guys has a different way of seeing things. Um, I have five brothers and sisters, so there's six of us all together. And every time we get together and we start playing a game called Remember When, which is to say, you know, we, we get together and say, you remember when Andy, my brother Andy, when he broke Steve's nose? Remember that one? And my brother Andy says, that's not what happened. And then my sister Shirley says, oh yeah, and remember when Andy, Andy was the bad one. Remember when Andy threw that dart and it landed in Steve's head? Um, and Andy said, that's not what happened. And everybody has a totally different, I'm throwing my brother under the bus, it's awesome. <laughs> anyway, and everybody has a completely different way of remembering the story. Six kids, six different versions of the story. And it's a lot more so when you've got people scattered over a whole large reason, region with from different countries and different audiences. When you write something, you know, you're writing something in school, right? Who are you writing it for mostly? In school. in school. If you're in school, you're writing a paper, who are you writing it for? Teacher. Your teacher. Which means you're going to write it the way you think your, your teacher wants it written, right? But if you're like, um, if you're like an author and you're writing books, who are you going to write it for now? The public. The public. And most authors have sort of a following. You know, they've, they're public. So if I'm writing um, kids' books, I don't really care about the people who read Stephen King or, you know, horror novels or anything like that. But if I'm, do you guys know who Stephen King is? Yeah. If I'm Stephen King, I really am not that interested in the, the audience who reads picture books or teen romances or anything like that. You have your own audience, your own group of people that you're focusing on. And these guys did too. They all had the same Jesus that they're writing about. But they had different experiences and they're writing to people, uh, to different people from different backgrounds so they're writing to different audiences. You gotta have, you gotta be able to write the way that people can read it. You know, it would be silly for me to go into the nursery school and start reading uh, a young adult novel. They would just go whoop right over their heads, right? But if I were to go into the high school and read one of the nursery school Bibles, uh, you guys would be bored out of your mind in about three seconds. So you have to know your audience, and each one of them has a different audience and a different point of view. With me so far? All right. Then I'm going to give you... Oh, it would be good if I were looking at the New Testament one instead of the Old Testament one. But I'm going to give you each a little packet here. Mm -hmm. First that. And then take one and pass one around. There may be enough, Wendy, because I think I included Amelia. Right, now if there isn't, I'll, I'll surrender. There we go. So, before we start looking at what each of these guys did, Take a look at this chart here for a second. You see this thing here? One of the things about writing papers in school is you're not allowed to, to copy, right? You're not supposed to be copying. And if you do, if you get, take something that somebody else writes, you're supposed to like footnote it, you know, and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm quoting so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, right? That's, that's how you're supposed to do it. They didn't really do that back then. They, they stole stuff from other people all the time and, and 
didn't even think about, you know, well, maybe I should put a footnote in here, or maybe I should come up with a bibliography. They didn't bother with anything like that. Why would they bother with that, right? So what you see here is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know, who's missing on this picture, by the way? John. Yeah, because John is totally different. Um, I have other words for John, but we'll get to him later. <laughs> But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are a group in a way. They kind of stole from each other a lot, and maybe from somebody else too. These three, if you put them together as a group, the group name for them is the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic. Have you ever heard of a synopsis before? You know what, it, what does it mean when you give a synopsis? Summary. Like a summary, yeah. You gotta, you gotta give a synopsis of something. So, these guys have something in common. Sort of the, the the nutshell of the gospel, they have in common. They have the same root source, as it were. Now, if you want a cool word, actually, it's just a letter, but I love it. Q. I think, I think Wendy knows exactly who Q is and also knows what Q means. But we'll start off with this. Let's pretend triple tradition. Well, let's not even pretend for a moment. See this purple part here? See where it says there, triple tradition? Tell me you see it, yes. 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 Thank you, good. That's something that all three of them have in common. That is to say, a common source. Somebody who wrote something before, at least they think, that all three of them are using uh, to, to riff off of. Now, they call this common source Q. Because so, it sounds cool. Is that for, for Cabela? Mm hmm it stands for a German word named Quelle, which means, ready for this? Source. I know, it's really original, but what are you going to do? <laughs> it stands for a source. And what it means is that each one of these guys, each one of them saw this source, read it, was inspired by it, got information from it, and said, I can build off of that. There's a big problem with this whole idea of this source, this triple tradition. It doesn't exist. Nobody actually has that. They put together what they think it probably could have contained, but they don't really know. All they know is that these three have some things that are really, really, really familiar or really in common, and any teacher grading those tests would say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, come to my office. We're going to talk about plagiarism. So they all three borrowed from the same source a lot. Now that's not the only thing that each of them did because they had different audiences, right? They each had a different group that they were focusing on. Pardon me, yes, I'm gonna go to my okay. next thing, but hi everyone. I hope see to see you, you later on this evening, or this afternoon. Oh, good, good, good. I'll hope. be there. I'll be okay, there. great. I'm, I'm doing a show, so I've gotta get ready. Yeah. I'll see you all. Good luck. Blessings. You. I'm just on run crew, I'm pulling furniture everywhere. Yeah, um, that's, that's half of my job. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> anyway, um, see you all soon. Bye. Thanks, Wendy. So they all had this the same common source, right? I don't know who it is. Nobody knows anything about him. He wasn't German, though. We know that much. It's just the reason it's in German is because some German came up with the idea. You know, what are you gonna do? Anyway, so they all have the same common source, but they all have different people they're writing to. And if you're gonna to write to somebody, if you write a letter to your grandma, you're gonna be talking a lot different than if you're writing something to one of your buddies at school. You just are. If you're writing something for your teacher, you're gonna be doing it differently. It doesn't matter who you are, you speak differently and you write differently to different people. That's just how people are made. And that, Jalen. Oh, I thought you had oh, no, no, sorry, sorry. Okay. So these guys have different audiences. 
and they want to make sure that they're that they're getting the information across so that people can understand it. Matthew, for example, Matthew is a Jewish guy, right? Makes sense. They were all Jewish, except they weren't. But Matthew is a Jewish guy, and he didn't live. <coughs> excuse me. Bless you. <coughs> Whew. Hold on. He didn't live in Jerusalem. He didn't live in Israel. But he was Jewish. And so for him, he was writing about Jesus to a lot of Jewish people who didn't live in Israel. They lived elsewhere. And they didn't mostly speak Aramaic like, like everybody in Israel. They mostly spoke Greek. Because outside of little little Israel, which is just a podunk little country, everybody spoke Greek. If anybody, you know, if anybody who was, everybody who was anybody spoke Greek. If you were one of the smart folks, you spoke Greek. If you wanted to do business, if you wanted to be in government, you spoke Greek. That's it. If you didn't speak Greek, you were meek. I don't know. I'm trying to think of something. Um, So Matthew was writing to a bunch of Greek speaking Jews who didn't live in Israel but who still had all the traditions. They just didn't really have uh, their feet on the ground in Israel. They didn't really have um, knowledge of what was really going on. So Matthew is writing this story, but he has to write to this to these people in ways that they will understand. So what he writes about mostly is about fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament, fulfilling the law. If you read Matthew, he says things like, you know, by doing this, Jesus fulfilled the law. By doing this, Jesus fulfilled the prophets. By doing this, Jesus fulfilled what was expected of the people of God or something like that. He's always fulfilling stuff. So Matthew, because people weren't there, they're trying, he has to convince them that Jesus is something good, right? And so he's always referring back to the Old Testament with all those things. He's always talking about the law and the prophets, you know, and Proverbs even. He's always talking about all those things, right? That's Matthew. Mark is different. Mark wasn't Jewish. Mark was a Christian convert. He came in late, kind of, and he came in there, and he's like, I've got I to explain Jesus to all these non-Christian or non-Jewish people in, the, in this area, in the Holy Land, right? Now, he actually did speak some Aramaic, but he was, wrote in Greek, but his Greek was really bad. So he probably wasn't a super educated guy. But Mark had another belief. Not only was he writing to people who were not Jews, so he had to sort of explain some things, but he also believed that the world was coming to an end real fast. And so, for him, Jesus is, is immediate. Everything that Mark says is immediately he went and did this. Immediately he went and did that. And if you look at the Gospel of Mark, it's the shortest Gospel. It's so short that he, there's no, no birth of Jesus. There's you know, no... No, no, nothing. It starts right off with the baptism in, in, the, in the River Jordan. Jesus is a grown man, and boom, it goes. And it's so short that he forgot the ending. What would you... Yeah, he's, exactly. What? The way his gospel ends is like this. Jesus rises from the dead. Some women uh, see the empty tomb, and they're afraid, and so they don't tell anybody the end. Like, what do you mean they don't tell anybody? So later on, he added a few paragraphs to say, oh, well, yeah, actually, they did go and tell people, but they didn't believe them, but but Jesus then appeared to them, the end. So (laughs) it's like, Mark was really like, let's just get this thing done. We don't have time to waste with this. Let's, let's, Let's get it going. And he basically thought they had to go to press because they didn't have, you know, very long before... The, the world was going to come to an end or the second coming was going to come and they didn't know what that looked like but something big was going to happen so he was real sense of urgency get it done, get it done, get it done real fast but then you got Luke 
Luke was another guy who may not have been a Jewish guy, and he really was not a, um, I don't know how to say him. He, he was a disciple. I mean, he wasn't one of the apostles. But Luke wrote his gospel for one person. Where'd that Bible go? You get it? Okay, Bill, do me a favor. I want you to open up the beginning of Luke, and I'm going to have you read something. There we go. Read the first paragraph or two. And read it loud so Amelia can hear. The Gospel of Luke represents Jesus as... Oh, you don't have to do that part. Just starting there. Dear... Theophilus. Theophilus. Many people have done their best to write a report of the things that have taken place among us. They wrote what we have been told by those who saw these things from the beginning and who proclaimed the message. And so, Your Excellency, began because I have carefully studied all these matters from their beginning, I thought it would be good to write an orderly account for you. I do so that you will know the full truth about everything which you have been taught. During the time when Herod was king of Judea. That's good enough. Thank you. Because you got the main part. And the main part was, who's he writing to? Who's he writing this book for? How do you say that name again? Yeah, Theophilus. Good job. Thea, I love the old names. Theophilus. If I ever get another dog, it's going to be called Theophilus. Liz doesn't know this yet. <laughs> anyway, he's writing to a guy named Theophilus, who... Nobody has any idea who he is, but they think he was probably, first of all, rich, because it was not uncommon to write things for somebody who is rich. And they would pay you money to uh, tell the story. And he might want to have raise money so he can go off on and do a lot of other work, because Luke was a guy who was a missionary. He was raising money often to go and spread the gospel. He traveled with a guy named Paul a lot. And we're going to talk about another book that he wrote in a moment. At any rate, so Luke was writing to one person. He had to impress one person with his book. But he does a lot of the stories, like if you're the Magi, you know, the three wise men, right? That's Luke. Nobody else. Nobody else has that. But Luke has this vision. And the vision for Luke is that the gospel is for way beyond just Israel. And that's fine. Theophilus is not a Jewish name. Theophilus is a Greek guy. So Luke is also focusing beyond just Israel. All right? So, so far, you've got a guy writing to Jews who are outside of Israel. You've got a guy who's writing to Gentiles inside Israel. And you've got a guy who's writing to a Gentile outside of Israel. So, but they're all using the same source and then they have their own other information. Uh, Luke and Matthew have some things in common. They, have, they share the most in common of anybody. Uh, and Mark, because he's so short, I mean... The book is short. He's not short himself. Um, he, he doesn't share as much in common. But Matthew and Luke have a lot in common. They're, they, they, they are the only two that have Jesus being born. We know Jesus was born, because that, but Mark and John don't bother with the birth of Jesus. Don't, they don't worry about it at all. Um, Luke and Matthew have birth stories, and then they have... Uh, a lot of the same miracles and the same things that Jesus does in common. So Matthew and Luke, definitely in trouble with the teacher. They were cheating. They were stealing from each other. Okay, maybe not, but they didn't care. That's their audiences. Remember, and this is the same thing for anything that, any, that anybody ever writes. You write for your audience, all right? That's all they're doing. So they got different stories. But what about John? Why isn't he a synoptic gospel? 
Braden, let's open up John and just, just read the beginning of, of John and, and I want to see if you can get a sense of, of what might be a little bit different. Just, just the opening, starting, starting there for that, maybe the first six verses. Oh, and you're going to have to read loud for Amelia. Before the world was created, the Word already existed. He was with God, and he was the same as God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through him, all, through him, through him God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without him. The Word was the source of life. And this life brought light to mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. God sent his messenger, a man named John. That's good enough. Thank you. So what kind of a beginning is that? It seems a little bit different. And I'm going to read another version of this to you for just a moment. Um, see if this, this sounds even more familiar to you, maybe. But let's just, 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 here we are. Just listen to this. See if this sounds familiar. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, who are we talking about? God. God. But who's the Word? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus. Ah, ain't like ain't nothing like any of the other gospels. I mean, if you look at look at uh, how Matthew or how Luke begins, well, was, we, uh, Bill read how Luke began. Uh, how does Mark begin? You want to hear how Mark begins? It's like this: the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Uh, John the baptizer appeared. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Boom! He just starts it right off, right? Uh, and who's he talking about? You know who Mark's talking about because it's the very first sentence, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, Luke starts talking about Jesus early, but he's, got, he's talking to Theophilus. And then you've got Matthew, and Matthew is... I know, bear with me for a second here. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So right off, an account of Jesus. And Mark is the good news of Jesus. And Luke says, you know, Theophilus, people have set aside, have set out to tell the story of Jesus. But John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He doesn't mention the name of Jesus until, like, verse 15. What's he doing? Why is he so slow in getting to Jesus? Because John is weird. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I would say, <laughs> because he was talking more so about the war, the word. And Jesus is just an embodiment of it, and not so much about Jesus. Ah, you're actually right on, on, a, on a good course here. John is talking about the Word. Now, if you know, notice how he began, in the beginning. Have you ever heard that before? Where? In the Old Testament. Huh? In the Old Testament. Yeah, and you said? Genesis. Genesis. Let's just read the opening lines of the opening book of the Bible, which is Genesis, right? Very first book of the book of the Bible. And it goes, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth. Do you think that was by accident? No. No. John is writing for his audience, which is a completely different audience from everybody else. He's also writing much later. And he's writing about the word not just Jesus the Christ. And you're like, what? What does that even mean? John wasn't that interested in what Jesus was doing 
as a human being. John, from the very beginning, wanted everybody to know that Jesus was more than just a person. That Jesus had always been, wasn't just, you know, didn't just become a person and that was it, but had always been alive as the Son of God, as something more than just a person. Jesus was the Word. There's this thing called Christology, which means how you see Jesus. A low Christology means you see Jesus mostly as a person who was a really good person, you know, and maybe somebody who God was working through. But a high Christology is where Jesus is more God than person, really. Um, and that's kind of where John was. In John's Gospel, first of all, he's writing to people who don't know Jewish traditions. They're not from Israel. I mean, Mark didn't have to describe Jewish traditions because he's writing to people, even though they're not Jewish, he's writing to people who know Jews in Israel, right? Matthew didn't have to describe or explain Jewish traditions because he's writing to Jewish people. Luke didn't have to describe, explain too much Jewish traditions because Theophilus was probably familiar with the traditions to a degree, um, though we don't really know, but he seems to be familiar. But John is... Well, John was one of the original apostles, so he's different from these three. These three were not original apostles. So John's older, and he's in trouble, by the way, because he's in exile. If you were one of the original apostles, did you know that you probably didn't have that long of a life expectancy? Uh, any idea how many apostles there were originally? So Grace knows... Braden, you got any ideas? Twelve. Say it loudly. Twelve. Twelve. Twelve apostles. The first one who, to die was which one? Anybody I know on that one? Judas. He died by suicide, right? When because he was the one who betrayed Jesus. So he died. Now remember, the apostles were probably late teens, early twenties. You know. Remember that. So they're a little bit older than you, but not much older than you. Think of them as maybe college-age guys, right? Not many of them lived to be that old. Peter was probably 25, 30 when he got killed. Uh, Judas was probably 20, you know? So think about this, because that's not that far for any of you. And it's way in the past for some of us. <laughs> But they were all pretty young, except for John. John is the only one of the apostles who, who, tradition has it, didn't get executed. I mean, and they had all sorts of amazing ways to kill these guys. Peter was executed on a cross upside down. I know, nasty, huh? Andrew was executed, sorry, uh, on a cross that was shaped like an X. Yeah. James was thrown off of a temple and then beaten with a stick. Not just any old stick, though. I mean, a very big stick. Um, think of a baseball bat. So these guys were all killed, except for John. John got sent to exile to an island way out uh, east called Patmos, uh, up sort of in the, by, the Greek, by Greece, I think. And he was sent to work in a salt mine, which is a nasty, horrible fate, worse than death in a lot of cases. Um, but he survived for a long, long time to be an old man. He's the only one who survived, and he wrote his gospel probably as an older person. So, I don't know, maybe he was seen. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't know what exile did for him, but one of the things he was writing for was people who didn't know Jewish traditions and didn't know Jewish language, or Hebrew or Aramaic. So what he was doing was explaining everything. So if you read John's Gospel, first of all, he's, he's thinking of, he's writing to people who, who don't care about the prophets. So we don't know nothing about prophets. We don't know anything about this God of yours. So he has to use a different kind of a mentality. He has to write in, in the kind of language that the Greek philosophers would use. And so he starts talking about, about word and spirit and 
wisdom and things like that, which is from Greek philosophy. But at the same time, he's also trying to make a link to the Old Testament so that they may well want to be able to learn from that as well. But they, he, has to, he has to talk about Jesus kind of like an idea. So the word is, uh, so the word he uses is word. And if you want to know the Greek word for that, just for fun, logos. If you ever hear anybody use the word logos, they're generally talking about Jesus. All right? So John doesn't bother with a lot of stuff that the others do. He doesn't have any of the same stories that, they, that the others do. He doesn't have the birth of Jesus. He doesn't have um, almost any of the miracles. What he does have, though, I mean, he has miracles. They're just different miracles. The only miracle that he has in common with the rest of these, and it's the only miracle all four of these Bibles have, is the feeding of the 5,000. Do you know the story of the feeding of the 5,000? Oh, guys, you got to know the story. This is a big deal story. It goes like this. Jesus is out teaching, and he's got a big crowd. Guess how many? 5,000. That's Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I know this. Huh? I think I know this. Okay, what happens? He, like, he only has a small amount of bread, I think. Mm-hmm. And then he's somehow able to feed <coughs> all of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's basically the same format for each of the stories with the little little variations. Jesus is out teaching, big crowds out there, and then the disciples come to Jesus and they you know, and they say, Jesus, yeah, you know, it's getting late. These guys are getting kind of grumpy and hungry. We get we gotta get we gotta send them away so they can go get food and stuff. And Jesus says, you guys feed them. And he's like, with what? And he's like, you can do this. And, and Andrew comes up and says, I found this kid. He's got five loaves, little loaves of bread, and two fish. What is that going to do for 5,000 people? And Jesus says, tell them all to sit down. And he starts dividing. He, he, he prays over the, the food. He thanks God for feeding them all. And then he starts breaking it up and breaking it up and breaking it up and breaking it up and it just never stops. And all the people are fed and then they collect up afterwards 12 baskets full of leftovers. Which means that they're going to be eating fish and bread for a very long time. So that's what they do. And that's the story, the only story that all four of the Gospels have in common except for one other story. At the very end, what happens at the very end of the, of the Gospels? Jesus dies. Jesus dies? How? Crucified. You know what that means? Somebody tell me what it means to crucify somebody. Great. Braden. Killed by the cross. Yeah. And what does that look like? I mean, what, what is actually going on there, just so you know? What, what happens when you crucify somebody? Billy, got any idea? Yeah, yeah. You get hung on it, and what happens to your body? Mm -hmm. For what it's worth, with crucifixion, there are two basic ways. Most of the time, I mean, we always talk about, you know, nailing his hands to the, most of the time they didn't nail people. Sometimes they did just to, out, of, out of cruelty. But they always had to tie you onto it also. They just put ropes here and here, here and here. Um, but not too tight. Just tight enough that you couldn't get away. You know, and then it'd tie your legs. And then you just stand there. One of the problems is you're standing out there, first of all, with almost nothing on outside. So you're going to be burning. You, you get nothing to drink or eat. So you're starving. And sometimes people come by and throw things at you so you can't protect yourself. But there's another part. You get tired after a while. And after a while, your legs start to give way, and you start to sag like that, and then you start to suffocate. So this could go on for three or four days with a lot of people, which is why it was one of the cruelest things. You, you're going to starve to death, 
you're going to die of exposure, you're going to suffocate. One of those three things is going to probably happen, but you don't know which one's going to happen first. And it could be any one of them. And sometimes, just to add insult to injury or injury to insult, they would stab you here and there, just, just to make it hurt more. Um, and if they were in a rush and they wanted you to get killed, they would take a big, basically a baseball bat, and they would smash your legs so that you would collapse and then you would suffocate more quickly. There's nothing good about that. So that's crucifixion. And that's what they do to Jesus. That's the other thing that they have in common. And, and this is what makes it a gospel, good news, after he dies, what happens? Yeah, he rises from the dead. Resurrection. That's what these four have. So they all have Jesus. They have one miracle in common, and that's it. Jesus, in all of them, does teach, though. He teaches them the same basic idea, which is God loves everybody. Forgive. Love even your enemies. Um, and God's... Uh, God's love for us extends even to the point of dying on a cross. That's the big thing there. God loves us like a parent. And the best way to know how a parent loves you is what a parent would do for their kids. And every parent I've ever met would absolutely die for their kids. That's what God tries to do this here. That's what the story is. But it's not over. Because just be, uh, because death doesn't have power. That's the gospel. That's what all four of them have in common. John is a little weird because he's constantly got Jesus saying, remember, I'm the Christ. Remember, I'm the one. Never in the other gospels does Jesus say that. So John sort of remembering things differently than the other three. Jalen. You know why Jesus chose to die at that time? <laughs> At that particular time? Like, he chose to give himself up at that time. Because he probably could have lived longer and teach longer. And then... He could have. But what was the... In each of the Gospels, the timing was kind of important. When Jesus was... As we understand the, the Gospel, Jesus was in control of his faith, right? I mean, he said... In, John, in John's Gospel, he says this all the time. You know, you couldn't do this if... if if I wanted to, I could just call the you know, armies of heaven, but it's to fulfill the purpose that God sent me for, that you're going to have control over me now, which is to say to kill me. And what was the purpose? I mean, the purpose was to act as, um, as a sign of God's love. But the timing for a Jewish person was really crucial, because when did it happen? What festival is going on, or what feast day, what, what holy day was happening just as he was crucified? Any idea? Passover. Passover. Have you ever heard of Passover? No? Yes? No? Yeah, but I don't really know much about it. Okay, you know what it is. You ever hear of it? Passover? You know what it is? Yeah, maybe. Bill, ever hear of it? Passover? Any idea what it is? Not sure? Okay, I'm going to tell you. Real quick. Remember Moses? Remember last week we were talking about Moses, the guy who, who was raised in Egypt, ran away. God sends him back in a burning bush to go and rescue all the Hebrew people from slavery, right? Now, I don't know if you've ever seen any of these movies with Moses, you know, like the um, Prince of Egypt or anything like that. It's a uh, cartoon. You can, it's a good one. Uh, it's weird, but it's totally inaccurate. However, <laughs> Moses goes back to Egypt and tells the Pharaoh, the king, you've got to let my people go. If you want to, if you, by the way, if you want to understand race relations in this country, then you have to understand Moses. Very important uh, figure. So G Moses goes to Egypt and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. So 
Moses calls to God and says, God, what am I going to do? God says, tell you what, let's send a plague of, and I'm going to get the order wrong, frogs. Millions of frogs show up one day. Everywhere, right? And, and Pharaoh's like, okay, okay, I'll let, I'll let your people go. So Moses waves his hands, the frogs go away. At which point Pharaoh says, just kidding, you're not going. So Moses goes to God, God, what am I going to do? God says, watch this. And a whole bunch of gnats and, and, and like, like billions and billions of gnats go everywhere. And they're in everybody's food and their faces, their mouths, their all the, everything. And, and, and Pharaoh's like, fine, fine, I'll let you go. Now this guy happens like three or four times, you know. And Moses has the, the, turns the uh, water of the Nile into blood. And, and every time the Pharaoh says, I'll let you go. And as soon as the, the uh, plague goes away, he says, just kidding, you can't go. So Moses says, God, I'm getting tired of this. And God says, we'll do one more thing. I was trying to go easy on him, but no more. Tonight, the angel of death is going to come over Egypt. And the angel of death is going to kill the firstborn son of every Egyptian, including their animals. All of their animals, all the, everybody, everybody in Egypt, except for you the Hebrews, because you are going to have a sacrifice of the lamb in every Hebrew household, and you're going to spread, you're going to paint the blood of the lamb over your doorpost. And every house that has the blood of the lamb painted on the doorpost, the angel of death will pass over that house. So that night, every firstborn son that was not in a house with the angel, with the blood of the lamb on it, Every firstborn son died, including Pharaoh's son. And at that point, Pharaoh says, go. I don't ever want to see you again. Just go. Go. That's why they call it the Passover. The angel of death passed over the Hebrew people. So Passover for Jesus was really important because Jesus was saying, and the, God was saying, here, you will not have death anymore. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus is the one whose blood, just like that Passover lamb back in, in, in Egypt, is going to save you so there will not be death. And what Jesus, is, what Jesus says for us is, not only will, you know, you're, you're not going to die right now, but death isn't going to have any power ever again. Yeah, you physically die, but you're not going to die forever. With Jesus, what, what God is saying is death doesn't really last forever. It doesn't have the power that we imagine it to have. You know, so what if you die? That's not, that's not important because in death you live. It's a different life, but you live. And that's important too because Israelites didn't always believe that. You know, they often thought when you die, you die. Or you go to some place called Sheol, which they had no idea what was, but there was no sense of life. And Jesus is like, no, no. What I'm saying to you is you will live and it will be good. So that's, that's what all four of these have in common. Resurrection. All right? Uh, I got to check my timing on here because uh, I don't want to keep you forever. But that's would, the gospel. What was the, I mean, what was the order of the gospels and they weren't written for the bible they were written and then completely remember together yeah later. good good point we're we were are going to talk about how these books all got slammed together because you know what there was no new testament these were all written for different groups of people and it was i mean mark was writing one thing for one group of people that's all he was doing you know there were epistles were probably written first but not all of them necessarily of the gospels Mark was probably written first. It seems to be the one that has had the first. Matthew and Luke were written roughly around the same time, and we're talking a generation after Jesus' death and resurrection. And then John, 
John was probably about 70 years after Jesus. I mean, he was, a, he was an old man. Yeah, he might have been not 70 years. It's, it's hard to know for sure. But he, his could have been written as late as 100 uh, AD, or what they call BCE, uh, I mean CE. Have you ever heard of CE and BCE in a history class or anything like that? You know, the Common Era and before the Common Era? Well, we can use that language too. Um, John could have been as late as 100 CE, but probably not quite that late. Um, everything, though, in the, in, the bio, in the New Testament was done within the first 70-some years, right? Everything is basically a generation. It's like, it, it's like, think about people who were alive during World War II. The whole New Testament was, was written from 1945 to today. That's, you know, and we still know people, you know people who were alive in World War II. Right? So that's, that's how common memory that is. Um, so there's the Gospels. They were written not first. The very first things were probably the epistles, some of the, or at least some of the epistles. Letters. Letters are quick and easy, right? You know, you write a letter, um, and most of those, most of the folks in those days, they didn't actually do the writing themselves. They had what was called a scribe. So you'd pace up and down, and you'd start talking, and you would really, you say, scratch that, you know. And but most people didn't do their own writing. They had somebody who did it. It was um, that's just how they did it. So now let's look at the epistles for a second. Actually, no, we're going to look at one other thing before we get to the epistles. I talked about Revelation. We're not going to talk about that anymore. That was written by John, and it looks like he was on drugs. If you try to read some of that, I mean, I mean, crazy visions and, and weird roundabout language. And it really, you could imagine that he was stoned writing half of that. It just, you have no idea what he's saying most of the time. But people who really get into um, weird stuff. They love Revelation because it's like, you know, it talks about four-headed lambs and stuff like that, doing all sorts, you know, with horns growing out of them, ten and a hundred eyes. And, you know, it's like, no, no, I just don't need to go there. Um, but there is another book to pay attention to. Acts. What is that one? Yeah, have you ever heard of that book? It's not gospel, and it's not an epistle. It's a different book altogether, and it's the only one like it. Now, if you open up real quick. <laughs> and then we, we're, we have to tell a secret about Acts. Because we have the four Gospels, and then we have Acts. And just, just, Grace, read the first five verses or so. In the first book? Huh? In the first book, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, read it out really loud, though. In the first book, the... Ophilus. The Ophilus. I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many conceiving proofs appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. Great. That, that's a good place to stop for a moment. Who is he writing to? Theophilus. Where did you guys hear that name before? Who? Somebody, somebody. Huh? Luke. Same guy. Luke is writing this. Oh. And he's writing to the same audience, right? Here's another trick. It's the same book. Luke wrote one book in two parts, which is why he's a little bit different. 
they were actually written as one manuscript. Part one, part, you've seen books, novels, you've read novels before where they have book one, book two. That's what he did. And later people got together and said, no, 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 no. We, we need the four gospels to be like all alike and end at the same part. So we'll just cut that out and make a different book. Which I guess if you're an editor, you can do that. But this book is different. It's the sequel. And literally, it's a sequel. It starts after the resurrection. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's, he's meeting with people. He's talking with people. They're having dinner and all this sort of stuff. And then he says, I got to go. You guys have work. I'm going to go up to heaven now. And he goes up. You, we've, you've seen the Feast of Pentecost before. We've talked about it in church, you know, where we go up there and we have people talking in different languages. We have red uh, it's in it's like 50 days after Easter, right? And it's kind of a cool holiday. That happens in in Acts, and only in Acts. What Acts is, it's a book of what the apostles did after Jesus went back up to heaven. So Jesus dies on the cross. All four Gospels agree on that. Jesus rises from the dead. All four Gospels agree on that. They don't agree what happens right after that. They all do different things. But then Acts picks up with Jesus risen, walking around, having dinner, and you know, all this sort of stuff, talking with folks, having a good time. And then he says, gang, I have to leave. But I'm going to send you somebody to take care of you, to give you power to give you strength and courage, and that somebody is called the Holy Spirit. So, one day, they're all gathered together after Jesus has left, and this big, feels like a big giant wind blows through everything, and all of a sudden, all the apostles, they're all together, and they look like their heads are on fire. It looks like they have tongues of flame on their heads. And they're like, this is different. This is new. And then they go out. And this is all also still around, I can't remember one of the feasts, but people from all over the known world are there. So there's people speaking lots of different languages, right? They go out there into the square and they can understand. And they can talk to people in all these different languages, which is why in church, whenever we have the Feast of Pentecost, we try to have people read the gospel in a lot of different languages. Just, you know, it's, it's, it's a very different kind of a thing, but the whole purpose is that the gospel is out there for everybody from all over the world. It doesn't matter where. So that's Pentecost, and that's in the Acts of the Apostles. And from that point on, what they tell is missions. Missions. Um, I'm going to give you a little map if I can find it. Take one, pass one down. We haven't really gotten to, to, to Paul yet, but we're about to. So the Acts of the Apostles mm -hmm, is divided up into two parts also. And it's very weird. Because after a while, thank you. You don't need to eat the, the map just yet, but I'll get to you in a minute. After a while, it talks about James, the brother of Jesus, becoming sort of the boss, the leader of the group in Jerusalem. But then they start talking about a guy named Paul, or Saul, right? Saul, he's kind of an important character here. And Saul is a Pharisee, which is to say one of the groups of people who hated Jesus. And Saul hates everything about these followers of Jesus. And he has, he, he has this goal in mind. Saul's goal is to arrest everybody who follows Jesus and either kill them or at least make them imprisoned, uh, to, to imprison them. That's his goal. And he does it pretty brutally. And, and you notice at this point, the apostles start getting killed. It's kind of a tricky time if you're one of them. And Saul is right at the head of it, 
But then he has this experience. He's, he's on a road traveling up to a city called Damascus, uh, which is in modern-day Syria. And he's, there's a group of these followers of Jesus up there. He's going to go after them. He's got permission to go after them, sort of like a bounty hunter. But then this bright light in the middle of the day sort of knocks him off his, his um, mule. He's on a donkey, I guess. And everybody is stunned, and it blinds him. And this voice comes from heaven and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul's like, who are you? What are you doing? I can't see anything else. And the voice from heaven says, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting, uh, and you got to stop. At which point Saul says, hey, okay. Um, and then the voice says to him, now you're going to go on into Damascus, and you're going to meet this guy named Ananias, and he's going to lay hands on you, and you're going to be able to see again. And then you, Saul, are going to serve me, Jesus. And Saul's like, I don't think so. And Jesus says, uh-huh. And Saul says, oh, okay. So he goes, he gets his sight back. He goes in prayer and meditation for three years. <laughs> He's not convinced still. But finally he does. He, he prays, he meditates, and then he starts learning at the feet of Ananias. And at the end of this period of time, he says, I'm ready to go on missions. I'm ready to go tell the world about Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm on it. And that's part of what the, the first half of the Acts of the Apostles is about. And here's the funny thing. Halfway through this book, the first half of that book, whenever it talks about Paul, it's always, he did this, he did that. Third person, right? You remember third person in English class? You know what the difference between third person and second person is, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Everything's in third person. Paul did this, or Saul did this. Somewhere in there, Saul changed his name to Paul. And he did this, he did this. And then all of a sudden, somewhere, I can't remember, chapter 10 maybe, chapter 11, suddenly it's, we did this, and we did that, and we did the other. And what does that mean? How do they switch the language, and why? I can give you a hint. I can give you a guess. I can tell you what all the sort of experts are thinking. But any idea why they would switch from they to us, from him to me to us? Jalen. Because he's working with Jesus and God. That's supposed to be all of us. Good, good thinking. I'm going to go a little more basic than that. Luke started traveling with Paul. You should put that there. All of a sudden, Luke is traveling with Paul now, and now it's us. We're doing this, we're doing the other, we're doing that. And by the way, um, it was a rough life because they kept getting in shipwrecks. Um, I mean, I mean, not just one, you know. They did, if they were really, they didn't have any GPS, they didn't have any motors, they had nothing. So every time they traveled in the, you know, in, in the sea, they, they, didn't, they were afraid to go too far out because it was dangerous. But of course, it's dangerous at any time. And so they kept getting shipwrecks. Every time they got a, a storm, these little tiny old boats, these like little bathtubs that they're sailing in, they crash. And so they, they get in several shipwrecks. Uh, and uh, we're going to look at some of these in a minute because this thing now tells some of the journeys that Paul has with Luke, perhaps. And now if you look at, it conveniently says first journey, second journey, third journey, and voyage to Rome. Uh, the voyage to Rome is difficult to see. That's the yellow one, right? But Paul was, if nothing else, an overachiever. Paul, first of all, just so you know, and we'll talk about him in his, in his epistles for a minute, his letters, right? But Paul was very smart very driven and very full of himself. If you read his epistles, Paul is constantly talking about how he's smarter than anybody else, how he's better than anybody else, how he suffers more than anybody else, how he is just so good, but humble. In fact, more humble than anybody else, too. That's Paul's 
That's how Paul is. Having said that, he really does suffer. He really is smart, and he really does do a lot of work. And he does believe Jesus is the Son of God. So he travels all over the known world. And really, when you think about it, that's kind of the known world for them. His, his ultimate goal that he never achieved was to go to Spain and to be a, a missionary there, to go tell people about Jesus there. He, he uh, didn't get there because he got to Italy and got his head chopped off. Uh, that's why the last. What's that? That's why the last journey ended in Rome. Yeah, that's why he, he got as far as Rome and said, "Yeah, don't go to Rome. Stay. Just if your name is Paul, just don't go. It's, it's not safe." <laughs> he got his head chopped off, but they considered that to be merciful because he was a Roman citizen. If he wasn't a Roman citizen, you know what he would have gotten? Crucified. Crucified. Chopping off your heads real fast, you know relatively painless so he he got you know vip treatment there anyway he went to all these different places all over and he kept trying to raise money at the same time I, you know you don't ever think about you, you know you think of sometimes of like a not pro, not for profit organization is always trying to raise money like saint james is always trying to raise money we're always saying pledge we're broke we don't have any money right well they did too all the time you know, you ever see these telethons for like public TV or public radio or, you know, all these sorts of things, you know, we, you know, the, uh, the Heart Foundation, uh, the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, all these different organizations are always looking for money, right? Well, same thing, because you got you to gotta fund it somehow. It costs money to go on journeys like this. It costs money to travel. It costs money to eat. It costs money to buy books and stuff. So they're always got to go begging for money. And um, we'll get to that in a minute when it comes back to the epistles, because at least a couple of those epistles are fundraising letters. That's what they are. They're, they're fundraising letters. So, but Paul was trying to get all over the world to visit people. He went to Phrygia, Cilicia, Galatia, uh, Troas, Corinth, Ephesus, uh, Colossae, um, and, and if, just so you know, in a modern world, a lot of this is, well, there's Italy, right? You see Italy? But you've got Greece, you've got Turkey, you've got Syria. I mean, you, that's a pretty big area. And just for fun, you see this point right here, right in the middle? What town is that? No, where are we? Kind of smacking me. Huh? Um, a little over right there. Myra, you know who became, a couple hundred years later, who became the bishop there? A guy named Nicholas. I don't know if you've ever heard of St. Nicholas. That's him. That's where he's from. He's from Turkey. Just so you know, um, Santa Claus is from Turkey. Now you know. That's where the whole story comes from, you know, about throwing the gold down the, the chimney. You, you know that story, right? It's, we'll tell that later on. Anyway, so that's what Paul does. He travels all over the world. And he, I mean, this, this, is, this is years that he's doing this because it takes a long time to travel anywhere. You don't go very fast in a little sailboat. You don't go very fast on foot. But Paul is really interested in getting the word out. And so he works very, very hard to do that. Um, which brings us to this, the epistles, okay? Now, so far, who is in the New Testament, who is the overachiever? Paul. Paul. Because he just did all this stuff, right? He is also the most egomaniacal, maniacal. I mean, he's the biggest, he's got the biggest head of anybody there. So he's always got an opinion. Which means, I want you to guess, who wrote the most letters? Take a wild stab at it. Paul. Paul! 
He wrote and he wrote and he wrote and he was constantly writing, telling people what to do. Constantly telling people how things are. But actually it's, it's more complicated than that. Because all these places that Paul went, he was founding churches. He was starting churches. So he goes to Ephesus, he starts a church. He goes to Colossae, he starts a church. He goes to Corinth, he starts a church, right? Um, other places, the only place, uh, I don't know what we're going to do. Anyway, um, so every time something happens at one of these churches, he writes back to them and says, we've got to fix this problem. So a lot of the letters he's writing to these different churches are about problems that are happening. People aren't believing things. Galatia, he goes to Galatia. He writes one epistle, one letter to the church in Galatia. It is the, the maddest, angriest, uh, most upset letter you've ever seen, but it's also my favorite in a lot of ways. He's writing to the people in Galatia because after he set up this church and then he went away to go to set up another church, some other guys came in there and said, but you got to become Jewish first. You got to become Jewish before you can become a Christian. You can't just become a Christian if you're not Jewish first. You got to become Jewish first. Well, when Paul heard this, he wrote back, and I mean, he, I can't even repeat the language he's, he used, in part because it was in Greek, but in part because if we translated it into English, your parents would be really furious with me. I mean, it was just. You, you could see the steam coming off this letter. He was screaming. And then at the end he says, look how big I'm writing this with my, my own hand. He's like, he's like scrawling his name all over the place. He was furious. I mean, the things he suggested that these guys do to themselves, I don't even think are even humanly possible. Um, but he was just, just furious. So that letter was dealing with a problem. So one of the reasons why they why Paul wrote epistles was to deal with, with problems. That's one reason to write an epistle. Another reason, I mean, and people had, quite often, when he would found a church, he'd stay there for a while, he'd leave, somebody else would come in to take over, and they'd either have questions, or they'd say, but people are saying this, or the outsiders, are, you know, the, the, the rest of the community is saying this, and so he'd have to go and answer questions. Sometimes it was people coming in and try to undo what Paul did. That's where he got mad. Next reason for writing an epistle, and one of my favorite letters there is one called Philemon. What a great name. It's just a letter to one person. But here's the story of Philemon and Onesimus. Philemon was a rich guy and a friend of Paul's. But in those days, they had slavery. Um, it was a little bit different because you could, you could be sold into slavery for not having enough money, or you could agree to become somebody's slave for X number of years, or for life if you chose to do it that way. Uh, or if you were a prisoner of war, you would, you would become a slave. Um, and so there are different, different types of it. So Onesimus was a slave of, of Philemon. And Onesimus had had enough of it, so he ran away. And he ran away and found Paul. Not that he had any idea that Paul was necessarily going to be it, but he got converted by Paul. And he said, I want to stay and, and, and work with you. And Paul figures out that he belongs to Philemon, uh, or at least legally speaking. So Paul says, I tell you what, I can't keep you here and, and you know, pretend that, that you don't exist to Philemon. That would be lying to him. So I'm sending you back. He's like, don't send me back. No, I'm sending you back. But I'm sending you back with a letter. And what the letter says is, let you go. But he's got to do it. He's got to let you go. So he writes this letter to Philemon saying, Onesimus is my child. You're not going to keep my child enslaved, are you? And you owe me big time anyway. Remember that. So that's the whole letter. He says, let him free, but you got to do it. I want to hear from you that you let him free. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, nobody knows what happened afterwards. 
We don't know if he did or not. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting take. So that's just the only one individual letter. And the other, the other reason that he did it, that he wrote letters, was fundraising. And it's not that simple. Because he's always writing letters to people saying, give us money. But it's not just give us money for us. He had this idea. And the idea was to raise a lot of money for the people in, in Jerusalem, the, the Christians in Jerusalem, to make a lot of money. He wanted to, to help them because they were in a really bad place. Because, you may not remember this from your history classes, but in the year 70 AD or CE, Rome trashed Jerusalem. I mean, destroyed everything. Um, so they were in a bad way. And Paul's trying to raise money for them. Anyway, that's part of it. But then you get something like the letter to the Romans, which is the first epistle in the, in the uh, New Testament. Paul only got to Rome once. He never left Rome once he got there because why? He got his head chopped off. Got his head chopped off. And that makes it hard to travel after that. So he gets to Rome, they cut his head off. I mean he actually spends a couple of years in Rome in, in house under house arrest uh, before they kill him. But um, his he wanted to get to Rome so that he could meet the church there. He did not found the church in Rome. He was introducing himself with this, his letter to, to uh, the Romans. He was trying to tell them what all he believed and what he'd been doing, sort of like a, um, a well, it was a big fundraising letter, but it was a letter that he wanted to go there. He, said he wanted them to welcome him so he could go to Rome, hang out there for a while, get a lot of money, and then go on to Spain, because he now had this idea to, that he wanted to go and, and start a church in Spain, um, which he obviously didn't do because he was dead. But uh, the letter to Rome is a big famous one. It's, it's a big one. And he told them basically everything he believed. He wanted them to get the whole picture of everything he had done, everything he believed, everything he knew about Jesus. So they would say, he's a good guy. Let's give him money. So that's what Romans is for. And that's the first epistle. Those are the basic things in the New Testament. And it's just touching base. It's the Gospels, Acts, and then the Epistles. We're not even going to mess with Revelation. Before we do anything else, I want you to stand up for a minute. Wait. We're in good shape. Good. I just want you to stand up in part because sometimes you got to stretch. And let's just stretch it out a little bit. But while we're standing, um, I want to think about one other thing, because you asked a question early on, which was, how did they even get any of these books in here? Why are these the books that are in the Bible? They were chosen by a group of scholars to sort it through and decided that this is what was going to be in the Bible, what was going to make up the New Testament. Yeah, pretty much. It's all by committee. Somebody said, I got a book. Let's, let's put it in the Bible. And they said, well, you don't even have a Bible. What's a Bible? And they said, well, well let's, let's create. You know, we already had the Old Testament, right? I mean, when, when Jesus was around, they already had what we call the Old Testament. All those books existed. Now, they had these letters, and then these other guys were creating these, these, these Gospels, which nobody had ever seen before. And they said, well, we've got all this stuff lying around. Maybe we ought to put them together in a book. And they said, you mean like the... Like the Old Testament? And they said, yeah, we'll just call it the New Testament. I mean, I'm being a little bit silly. Um, so they said, yeah, let's figure out what needs to go in there. Now, i got to tell you something. There was a lot of stuff to go through before they picked what was going to go in there. The number of Gospels they had to go through before they came to those four was like a dozen. There's a Gospel of Peter, a Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, uh, I can't even remember. There's just tons of Gospels. People had been writing from their own perspectives, and you don't know exactly, because it's, it's hard to tell 2,000 years later, which ones were, were you know, 
written later and which ones were written earlier, so it's difficult to know, but there are several that were written about the same time frame as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they didn't put them in there. For example, the Gospel of Thomas, which is the most famous gospel outside of the Bible, the reason they didn't put it in there, aside from the fact that Thomas writes some very weird stuff in there, but some of the stuff is the same. But what he doesn't put in there is the crucifixion and the resurrection. If he had put the crucifixion and the resurrection in there, we would have had a fifth, uh, fifth gospel. As bizarre as some of the stuff is that he writes. Um, I mean, and it does sound like he's... Um, been doing some stuff. Anyway, so Gospel of Thomas is one of them. Gospel of Peter is one. Gospel of Mary is another. There's a, dun a bunch of them. And I didn't, I didn't print them out for you because you, we don't have really time to go into it. But they had tons of letters also. Not just Paul's letters. And in fact, there are other letters in here. Um, Peter, there's a few P letters from Peter. From a couple of letters from John. Uh, there's one letter called the letter to the Hebrews, which nobody has any idea who wrote that one And it's not even really a letter. It's just sort of like an essay um, So you've got bunches of letters that are in here that are not Paul But you've got a ton more that are from other folks. I mean, there's Clement You've you've read Clement, right? First letter first Clement and second Clement and they, they sat there and they had all this stuff and, and they basically had like a, a board meeting. You can sit down now. And they said, guys, how much stuff are we going to put in here? We can't, we, we can't, you know, paper's expensive. We're not going to, how are we going to do this? And so they sat down and they said, here's the, here's the rules we're going to work with. It has to have been written by somebody in the first generation of it. So anybody who either directly knew Jesus or was connected to people who knew Jesus. It's got to be one of them. So Clement's out, good as he is, smart as he is, holy as he is, he wasn't first generation. He was second generation. He's gone. So they, they put him in a drawer somewhere. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to think. Thomas, he doesn't have the crucifixion and, and the resurrection in there, so he's out. You know, and they, they sort of set up these rules and what they were going to do and everything. Uh, but part of it was... And, and I don't know how else to say it, but Paul was such a big personality, and he wrote so much that a lot of his stuff ended up in there. But there's a funny thing in one of Peter's letters. Peter and Paul didn't really get on all that much. And so there's one of the letters where Peter's writing, and he says, Listen, our brother Paul often writes difficult things to understand. So just skip it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think he actually used the word skip it. But um, the point is, they didn't always see things the same way. The Bible has never, ever been something where people see things all the same. And that, for me, is really one of the most important things. If you want to get one story, don't look at the Bible. If you want to have, you know, one one book where everybody agrees with everything and God says one thing and everybody understands it the same, just don't look at the Bible because that's not it. The Bible is a mess, and it's supposed to be a mess. It is a, it's this, a fight. It's like a fight in, within the family where everybody's sitting there saying, no, it's this way, no, it's that way, no, it's the other way. The point isn't that everybody agree. The point is that everybody's included, that everybody's in it, and that in that one family, the parent still loves everybody. That's the point. You know, and you do try to work on it. You still work on the family. I mean, you, you have siblings. Maybe you have siblings. I don't know how many of you have siblings. You have a sibling. You have a sibling. You have a sibling. You don't have a sibling. Well, I have five of them. Would you like one of mine? Mm -hmm. You can have them. <laughs> You can have my brother, Andy. <laughs> I don't trust people named Andy. Oh, hi, Andy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but yet, with siblings, you sometimes get in fights. Is that accurate? Has, have you ever gotten in a fight with any of your siblings? 
Okay, so it's not just me. You have siblings? You said that with great fear and trembling. <laughs> Uh, and and yet you're still siblings. You know, as my brother used to say, and you've heard this before, it's okay if I beat up my little brother, don't you touch him. I don't know if you ever heard that before. Let me tell you, um, you know, he could beat me up all day long, but if somebody else touched me, he was all over him. Funny thing, I don't, I don't quite get it, but in the family, as it were, there's a lot of argument and fighting and everything. And yet, that's the point. You don't have to see everything the same. You don't have to agree on stuff. You don't even have to sort of understand what the heck you're doing. But you know that something big happened here and that it binds us together and we're going to work on this because we're going we're to walk on this journey together. We're all going someplace together. That's kind of the main point. Um, both of the Old Testament where it's a journey started by Abraham. Remember Abraham? You know, the guy who was supposed to go kill his kid and stuff like that? But it continues on here. You know, travel in Israel is an important theme. You've got Abraham leaving his family and going... To, the, the prom, to, to Canaan, following God. You've got them going to Egypt uh, a couple of generations later. You've got them leaving Egypt 400 years later and traveling for 40 years till they get back to the promised land. Um, Jesus was always on the move. Paul was always on the move. The whole vision of us traveling together you don't always have to like it. You always, don't always have to agree that it's traveling together. Um, and so that's what these are doing. So you've got the Gospels. And what is a Gospel, basically? Like a biography. Story of Jesus. Like a biography, right, right. Story of Jesus. His story. I mean, basically everything in the New Testament is about Jesus, right? But the biography part, that's the Gospels. And every single one of them has at least what? All four Gospels have what? One or two miracles. Well, one, one in particular. The, the 5,000. The five, feeding of the 5,000, right? Crucifixion. And the crucifixion and resurrection, right? Um, I'm going to sh- read for you in a minute the ending of, of Mark and then the second ending of Mark to show you where he, they like, oh, maybe we better say a little more. So that's, that's the, the, the uh, Gospels. They're biography. Acts is like a travel log. Actually, if you read that, you get a really good view of, of a lot of the, the uh, Mediterranean areas because it's always, well, we went to this state and it was like this, this, this. You know? And so they, they talk about where they, all these different travels they have and you still get an idea that Paul's big-headed and obnoxious. And he was big-headed and obnoxious and people said that to him. Um, but then you've got the epistles, mostly from Paul because he was big-headed and obnoxious, and he was constantly telling people what to do or asking them for things. Um, Guess how much I like Paul. No, (laughs) sorry. He was an important guy. He was. But you got to read him from your own lens. My lens says, man, he would have been annoying to be around. Um, So so there he is. Uh, They're all created... This book was created by people gathering up all these different letters and, and stories and, and people saying, maybe if we, we put them together, we could make them more convenient, sort of like with the, with the, uh, the Torah and the um, prophets and the writings. We could do it just like that, make scrolls like that. And they did. But it took almost 200 years before they decided what was going to go in there. The Bible was not planted all at once. It wasn't just handed down from heaven, and it wasn't written by the hand of God. If anybody tells you that, they are lying. Um, It was written by human beings, and you can say inspired by God, but that doesn't make them perfect. Inspired does not make you perfect. It just means that you have been moved by God. You're not going to get all details right, because if you had all details right, everybody would agree with everybody, right? 
So it is written by individuals writing to specific people about specific things, so an audience. It's committee work. If you ever have to do group work in school, you know, where you have to be like five people and you have to create a project or something, have you ever had to do that? And you know, how, n never have yet? No, not yet. Oh, uh, yeah, fine. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough because that means you have to depend on everybody for one grade. And if you've got a couple of slackers in there who are not doing their job, all of a sudden you're doing it all yourself. And it's hard. So, um, and, and if you don't agree with each other on stuff, you, you spend half your time fighting over what font size you're going to use for your report or what font you're going to use. I want to use Arial. No, I want to use Times New Roman. No, I want to use, you know, Garamon or whatever. You can fight over stupid stuff. And they did a lot. Um, and they spent a lot of time trying to figure out what goes in here. What's the important information? Ultimately, the important information was God, is a, God loves us like a parent. God sent Jesus to be one of us, to show us how much God loves us. Jesus did this by you know, feeding the hungry, caring for the homeless, uh, welcoming the immigrant, and forgiving sinners, uh, and then dying for us and rising again to new life. After that, it's just trying to figure out what it all means. And that's what they did. That's the basics of the New Testament. So, Gospels, Epistles, Acts of the Apostles, just for travel log, and then the Revelation to John, which is just weird stuff that we're not going to go to. Um, I don't have the patience to deal with John. All I can say is, he was writing that, to some churches, and it's almost like he was writing it in code. Um, do you remember the Soviet Union? Do you, I mean, I, obviously you weren't even alive when it folded, but you've probably heard, read about it in history and stuff like that, right, the Soviet Union? During the Soviet Union, there were a lot of um, people who were resisting the government's work, and they had to do it all underground. So there's a lot of underground work. And a lot of people who were resisting it, they used to, they, they, in order to communicate with each other, they would try to do it very publicly, but with code. So a lot of authors like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, they would write novels and they would put information to pass along right in the middle of the novel, but it was, it was coded in a, in a way that the censors never got it, but the people they were trying to communicate with did. And some of, the, some of the scholars believe that with, when John was writing Revelation, there, he was writing it in such a strange language so that some people could understand what was supposed to be, what the message was, and others couldn't. Um, because they were in a, I mean, remember, he was in exile. He was in the, in the salt mines. Um, so in his trying to communicate had to be done kind of secretly. I don't know if that's really what happened, but all I can say is it's weird. And what it really just says is God is in control. God was in control through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the beginning and the end of all things. And it we got to follow Jesus. Basically, that's what, you know, shape up, do your jobs, uh, pay attention to what Jesus commanded, don't slack off. And that's how it ends. That's the New Testament. Any questions? No. <laughs> Any? If I were to ask you what the two main divisions are, what would you say? The Gospels. Well, also there's the Acts. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll let Acts slide for a minute, but you got the Gospels and the Epistles. And, the epistles. and what is a Gospel? Biography. Biography, right. And what is an Epistle? A letter, right. And what are the primary reasons for the letters? Problems in some reason. Yep, dealing with problems and getting money. Mm. Which is what we still do, right? I mean, it's come pledge time, what do I do? We write a letter. <laughs> it's important work. We, I get so many letters from organizations looking for money. And it's all the same thing. These are epistles. That's all they are. 
we do this really important work. We're changing lives. We're doing all this good stuff, and we can't do it without your money. Please pledge. Same thing. Same thing. They're either dealing with problems or they're looking for money because that's how the world works, you know? And the apostles, they had to have it the same thing. They had to have the same stuff. So that's it. I got nothing else for you right now, uh, but you get handy maps and you get handy graphs. Um, oh, synoptic. What's synoptic? Summary. All right. Now, before we go, last thing. Everybody stand up. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments? Who can do all ten of them? Okay, Braden, start us off. What's number one? Um, like, pray. It's like, worship God, no other God for you. There you go. You have no other God but me. What's number two? Bill. Um, do not make any idols. Good. Don't make any idols. What's number three? Grace. You shall not use the Lord's name with malice. Good. You shall not use the Lord's name with malice. Number, number four, Andy. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I love that. Number five. What's number five, Braden? Or Braden, Jalen. Oh. Not fair. Oh. Ah. Here we have a shift. We go from God in the first four, and now we shift to people. And the first people you have to think of in your life. Oh, um. Parents. Yeah, although we use the word honor, but you know, and it's honor your mother and your father, and your father and your mother. Good deal. Okay, that's number five. Number six, Brayden. Mm, shall not murder. Yeah, don't don't kill people. What's number seven? Uh, shall not steal. Good. Don't steal stuff. What's number eight? <laughs> mm hmm. You want to pass, and you'll come back to nine or ten. Okay, what's number eight, Andy? Number eight? Mm-hmm. So steal, but... No, you already did steal it. adultery. Adultery. Don't commit adultery. That's always, don't do these Get things. Get me out of the, the numbers here. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So that's number eight. Number nine? Um, I, I just had it. I just forgot it. Okay. Who knows number nine? Bring not bear false witness. Do not bear false witness. By the way, what does bearing false witness mean? Like lie. Yeah, not just lie, but don't lie about someone else. I mean, that's that's the the big important part. In particular, in a legal sense, you don't lie about someone else to get them in trouble. All right. And what's the last one? Good deal. Don't covet. And what does that mean? Don't covet. Desire. Want. Take. Yeah. Often take. Uh, covet often involves, uh, or leads to stealing or adultery or something like that or murder. Uh, it is the only one of the second five, well, of the, of the, of the second half that is not an action. Because coveting isn't an action, is it? It's all up here and here. So there's, there's our Ten Commandments. All right. Uh, Nicene Creed. Ready? Everybody together. We believe in one God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, but one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
and come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Good deal. Summary of the law. Who can do the summary of the law for me? Just one person. Go ahead, Bill. Really loud this so I can hear that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two, depend all the law and the prophets. You can throw that in there. It makes me feel good. It's also what Jesus said. Upon those two, depend all the law and the prophets. They summarize everything that they're trying to say in the Old Testament. Good. That just leaves us with... Mm -hmm. I remember like the first part. Okay. <laughs> Tell me one part that you remember. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay. Who remembers anything else after that? The shadow of death. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> make the people lie down in green pastures. Mm -hmm. He leadeth them beside still waters. Okay. Who remembers anything after that? Something about a cup. Ah, something oh, about a cup. Um, my cup runneth over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can lead the clean in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We're getting to the. Tell you what. Right there. Prayer books, right there. 23rd Psalm. And we're using the, uh, the burial office version because that's got the King James. So you want page 400 and. <laughs> Andy's got it. You get me. I got it. He's got it. Page 476, guys. You got it all? 476 or 4? Look at that. Oh, yeah. oh, it's the wrong version. No. <laughs> this is the one you guys agreed on, I think, which is the King James Version. So you ready? You, if, you, if you don't need to look, don't look, but we'll see how we do. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One of the things about the Psalms, just as a side note, every single one of them somehow makes it, brings up my enemies. You know, most of them do. And it's always rub their noses in God. You know, it's like, come on, can't you leave your enemies alone for a while? But no, every one of them, even this one, the most pastoral one, the most lovely peaceful one there it is it's like ah i'm gonna prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies ha 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 so that i can eat and they can suffer it's not like shakespeare well <laughs> i mean most of the grammar and everything i know well when when my great aunt died now my great aunt was uh she was an old woman she was uh she was in china during world war ii she was a professor and she was in China, she got captured by the Japanese, I'm not kidding, and she spent most of the war in a Japanese concentration camp. This is where my great aunt did. Um, but when she, when she died in the 60s, we had all this stuff cleared out from her home. She was a funny woman. But she had a book, a Bible, right? And in the Bible, there's a thing that said, there's an article that she had glued to the cover, and it said, is it scripture? Or is it Shakespeare? And then it had different quotes, and it said, which is it? Is it the Bible, or is it Shakespeare? And the idea, this is, this is from the 1950s. Nobody had a clue. You know, Shakespeare, Bible, eh, yeah, people throw stuff around. It's like, I don't know. You know. To be or not to be, that must be from Jesus. No, <laughs> it's not. 
you know, so yeah, you're right. Uh, it, it does sound a lot like it because the language from the King James Bible is actually pretty much this contemporary with Shakespeare. So that's, that's why. Um, and we just don't speak like that anymore. I do think these and thou's ought to come back, though. I like them. I speak it every summer. Oh, yeah? Yeah, no deal. Oh, well, of yeah. course, of course. I was thinking of, of writing a story of uh, modern day as if we hadn't gotten rid of these and thou's. Everything else was modern language, but for the these and thou's. Good. Oh, no, I, I can't say that on camera, no. <laughs> but think if you were trying to like get get mad at somebody and you were like, cursing them out and you were oh. the these and the thou's. I mean, it'd be kind of funky. Well, there was this one line that I had Mercutio, Romeo, and Juliet, my best friend was Tybalt, and I was like all cursing at him and shit. Yeah, it'd be kind of fun. Doubt. How would you do that? Like, um, yeah, laughing, yeah, rolling on the floor laughing. Yeah. That would still be normal. C could you imagine the internet in King James English? <laughs> There's this website. I can like type sentences into and change it to King James English. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, I think that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. could, could you, I, I would love to see like a stand up comedian do the entire routine in, in, in King James. Would that be funny? Yeah. What would you do if your teacher came in one day and did all oh, perfect King James or, or your Shakespearean English? It'd be like, you know, where, where is thy homework? Anon, anon. <laughs> be fun. Yeah. Or, or, you know, how would you do a test? Anyway, this is totally off the subject. Do you, do you have a ride, or is yeah. your ride here? Yeah, they're here. Okay. Your ride is here? Somewhere. That doesn't sound very inspiring. <laughs> well, I, well, I don't know. I'm kind of stuck in a room. Do you have a phone? No. Do you need to text them and let them know you're done? No. Okay. Do you have your ride here? I think so. Okay. Um, Andy, you can't leave until everybody's gone. Yep. All right, let's 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 get rid of you. I mean, let's 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 send you out into the world. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Bill. Oh, you know what I should do, though? I should turn this off.